know what's really interesting is that I'm starting to get the exact uh, same gray hair that Doctor Strange has, so at least I can cosplay as that character once this inevitably takes over my hair. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness not only sees the return of Benedict Cumberbatch, Benedict Wong, and Elizabeth Olsen to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but also the return of Sam Raimi to the director's chair, his first feature-length film in nine years, and his first superhero movie since the critically divisive Spider-Man 3 in 2007. This is probably the first MCU movie in a long time where the discussion's not just about the connected universe or the comic book aspects, but also about the director himself. Himself. Sam Raimi pretty much established the modern superhero genre, so regardless of how the movie would turn out or the implications for the greater universe, I was just so happy to see him directing something, especially on a Doctor Strange movie where he was allowed to just go all out. I'm a Sam Raimi fan, and you know, in this day and age, it's surprising that a producer-driven studio allowed a director to do what he does best. The movie has high energy from the beginning. It's rare to see something from Marvel with a two hour runtime, but a majority of this feature has a well executed pace. We're dropped into the multiverse with the introduction of America Chavez and a variant of Doctor Strange. If you've seen Loki, WandaVision, and some of the other MCU movies, you'll be up to speed on some of this, but even if you haven't watched everything, you don't get too confused. Along with meeting new characters like Chavez, who I have almost no knowledge of, they have enough details shown visually rather than told in exposition. America Chavez has the ability to travel the multiverse, and she meets with the MCU's Doctor Strange. However, she has trouble trusting him because the last Doctor Strange she met literally tried to sacrifice her for the greater good. So, it makes sense that she doesn't immediately want to make an alliance with the guy, but alas, they team up and they decide to fight the witchcraft monsters that have been chasing her. To fight the witchcraft, Doctor Strange hopes to get the help of Wanda Maximoff. However, when he meets up with her, she already has her own plans to use America Chavez's power to travel the multiverse to be with her children who don't exist in her universe. I thought it'd be pretty tough to have two characters with their own emotional arcs, especially amidst all the action. However, the creators managed to give something to both Doctor Strange and Wanda. Very simply put, she's the villain, he's the hero, and they never shift the focus too much where this ends up being another big group Avengers level movie. Doctor Strange has an arc here. As we've learned from the previous entries, Doctor Strange is always trying to control the situation, which is established here as well. We learn a little bit about his past and get a much better representation of his relationship with Christine, which helps to explain why he always intervenes in conflict. He wants to fix everything on his own, no matter the price. And we see throughout the multiverse that the other Doctor Stranges can't be trusted because of this character flaw. We also get Scarlet Witch's relationship with her children throughout the multiverse, something that's been continued from WandaVision. I assumed that we were going to get some kind of anti-hero complex with Wanda, but no. She's the villain. She's dark, demented, she destroys everything, she doesn't let up. Honestly, I know that Marvel was going for a horror vibe with this one, but I never thought they would go this far with it and I love it. America Chavez is also a great addition to the cast. This is Zoshi Gomez's first movie. She brings the youth and energy to the role, but there's also enough character to make the audience care about her. We learn what happened to her parents and how she can't control her power. Honestly, it's nice to see a new superhero who doesn't have a full grasp on her powers, which helps tie the ending together. A lot of the character beats are simple, in the best kind of Sam Raimi way. It really takes me back to Spider-Man 2, how the dialogue was never too complex, but it got the emotions across. The visuals are spectacular, which, I mean, Sam Raimi, how can you go wrong? But there was that little ounce of me that thought maybe he wasn't going to be allowed to be himself in this film, they weren't going to let him go all out, but they really do. There's a scene where Mordo is explaining the Darkhold, and Wanda, in a different location, starts summoning the Darkhold. Now usually if they were to do something like this there would be parallel editing as he's explaining it and we would see shots of her summoning it. 
But here, they actually do a really cool effect where they superimpose shots of her summoning the Darkhold while we get shots of both Doctor Strange and America Chavez being told this story by Mordo. It's all superimposed in one frame. And it's a type of scene that we just, frankly, don't get a whole lot of in big budget movies anymore. There's unique choices in camera angles and montages. I also found a lot of the action to be engaging. The monsters have a lot of expression. Things don't get too choppy. There's a nice level of violence. And there's ideas that could be laughable, but the world that has been established, you accept the weirdness, specifically that music note battle. There's a lot of extras in the background, which might be a weird thing to bring up, but if you notice in a lot of recent MCU movies, oftentimes when they're in like cities or really on other planets or anywhere, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of extras in the background. Sometimes the cities feel a little empty. This New York and the different places they travel to are very vibrant. There's people. There's people running away from the monsters. There's people interacting. I was thinking about the Spider-Man franchise, how a lot of the extras were often given lines that made them way more memorable than a normal extra would be, but they were going for that same approach with this movie. For a lot of reasons, this could be a top-tier Marvel movie, surpassing a lot of the past entries simply for how different it feels from the other ones. I could see myself enjoying this at home without the audience reaction. However, right now, I don't think it's a 5 out of 5 star movie. There's a few magic scenes where characters are standing but not doing much, so the choreography looks boring. Some of the set pieces are meant to look epic in scope, but I just find them to be a little bland. In the second act, things start to slow down only because a lot of conversations become repetitive. Just how many times can you deliberate with the villain on their motivation? In a lot of ways, there's not too much madness in this either. They do have some multiverse hopping, but overall, they only visit two different universes. Visually appealing places, but not anything groundbreaking or jaw-dropping. But it probably doesn't help that the greatest multiverse movie ever made, Everything Everywhere All at Once, only came out a few weeks before. Also, I think Danny Elfman's music works for this type of movie, but I do miss Giacchino's theme. I also think this is a good time to get into spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movie, stop the video here. I think this is a great example of fans just going too wild with some of the theories before the movie comes out. With No Way Home, I think a lot of fans just got lucky in figuring out a lot of the surprises that were in store, so there wasn't a whole lot of disappointment once the movie came out. With this one, a lot of the crazy theories don't happen. I think a lot of people just hyped up what was going to happen in this movie, but a lot of it isn't there. Even I was getting into the hype. I remember at one point someone said that this movie was going to have cameos from nearly every character and actor who appeared in any Marvel movie before the MCU started. But the thing is, this movie is just not that type of movie, for all the best reasons. Now, with the Illuminati, they don't end up playing a major role. They're only here for an extended cameo. but almost deliberately as a troll to the audience. Not only do they die, but they die in the most gruesome ways. I'm glad I got to see Haley Atwell and Lashana Lynch duke it out with Scarlet Witch, and it's great that Anson Mount got to be Black Bolt again after the Inhumans. But these arrogant assholes from a different universe don't amount to what audiences were hoping for. They're meant to be this stoic, overly confident team. We finally get John Krasinski as Reed Richards, who I fully expect to return for the Fantastic Four movie, but it's too bad we didn't get to see much of his powers. Even Patrick Stewart, who's a mix of the Fox movies and animated shows versions of Professor X, enters the Scarlet Witch's mind in a cool sequence, but he dies. It shows how powerful the Scarlet Witch is, and as its own movie, it works great, but for the MCU as a whole, if Reed Richards returns in the future, or Patrick Stewart comes back again, which I'm already hearing rumors about, doesn't it seem pretty weak to kill them off in different universes only to bring them back from another universe? Where are the stakes in that? It undermines a shocking sequence. Even the Scarlet Witch, who seemingly dies in the end, I'm seeing reports that Elizabeth Olsen will return. I should also mention Elizabeth Olsen gives one of the best performances in the MCU in this film. I gotta say, I, I wasn't too impressed with a lot of the performances throughout, but specifically Elizabeth Olsen 
yeah, she was entertaining to watch. And I know the multiverse opens up many possibilities, but it's a bit lame to keep resurrecting characters. But I don't think they cared about the MCU perspective on this one, which honestly, I think is necessary. As its own movie, I had a great time, as it doesn't need to adhere to the cinematic universe. But I can see Marvel fans being disappointed. For me, it truly is a Sam Raimi movie all the way through. But I suppose the real test for what you want out of this movie depends on your response to the final end credit scene where Bruce Campbell's Pizza Papa is punching himself, finally stops, and he breaks the fourth wall. Now, are you disappointed because there isn't a post credit scene for the Fantastic Four or something else? Or are you happy to see an Evil Dead tribute that matches the tone of the overall movie? What are we really wanting out of movies nowadays? Something good or something that builds towards secret wars? I just want a good movie. But Marvel is often pretty good at doing both. Regardless of the Illuminati's deaths and other inconsistencies, I still think this is good on its own, while building hype for even bigger things to come. I just can't keep comparing every Marvel entry to Endgame. A good movie just needs to tell a visual story with its characters, and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness succeeds. I think I would give Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness 4 out of 5 stars, but there's a lot of room to grow from there with future viewings. Thanks for watching the video and special shout out to Lauren, Anthony, Anna, Kirsten, Spencer, Lucas, Ryan, and Robert for supporting me on Patreon. By joining my Patreon, you can get exclusive blogs and videos, and for just $7, you can get your own monthly movie review. I hope you stick around, cinephile, and have a happy, productive day.